Hello, and welcome to Voices in Leadership During Crises. My name is Sarah Bleich. I'm a professor of public health policy at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. I'm also the Carol K. Forsheimer Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Voices in Leadership focuses on effective leadership to create positive change in public health. During the coronavirus outbreak, our regular series has been modified in two important ways. The first is that we'll be broadcast using Zoom. The second is that we're creating a very special focus on what it takes to lead during crises, especially during this global pandemic. Today, we welcome Dean Michelle Williams and Representative Jeffrey Sanchez who to talk about the op-ed they wrote in the Washington Post on June 4th, titled, Racism is Killing Black People. It's Sickening Them Too. Michelle Williams is the Dean of Faculty at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Jeffrey Sanchez is a former Massachusetts State Representative and lecturer at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Michelle and Jeff, welcome to the program. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like to toss the first question at both of you, and Michelle, if you could please answer it first. And that is, can you tell us about the inspiration for the op-ed that you and Jeff worked on? Sure, thank you. Um, before, I, before I answer the, uh, your question, Sarah, let me just pause and take a moment here and thank um, Bob Lendon uh, for inviting me to participate, uh, Jeff and myself to participate. Um, I will be honest with you and the audience that my first instinct was to decline the invitation, largely because it's not my, um, it is not my style um, to really share um, much about uh, what hurts me, what frustrates me. Um, but I, on reflection, I said, yes, I would do this. And I would do this with Jeff, who, as we've worked together over the last 12 weeks, um, managing the challenges and the carnage uh, that's resulted from the COVID uh, pandemic, um, I've shared a lot more with my, of myself with Jeff, um, and we've known each other for a lot of years. And this op-ed actually came out of our working hard and harder every day, and it feels like that's been our life's story, Jeff, uh, to address a problem where it becomes very clear that we alone can't address this problem of systemic racism. Let me be specific. For 12 weeks before um, this conversation, we were struggling with the disproportionate burden borne by the black and brown people in the communities that we're from. And we were hustling and working harder than ever before on addressing what is pretty clear to all of us now, a uh, 400 year history of systems in place that make vulnerable black and brown people uh, to a pandemic. And on top of that, we all witnessed um, very clearly in one week, a black man in Central Park um, birding and being at risk, what I call a near miss of having um, a police called on him um, because of a telephone call by someone who felt that he was um, overstepping his bounds, whatever those were. And days later, we all witnessed uh, George Floyd lose his life um, as a part of police brutality. All of those are very complex narratives. And Jeff and I um, wanted to share our perspective that this is about systemic racism, that for this country, black and brown people's lives are incredibly impacted in complex ways from birth to death by a system of racist, anti-black, anti-brown um, systems that cost us our lives. And we're seeing this in brighter light and in a more concentrated way than ever before. And really that's the long answer, sorry, Sarah, of, of, of all that was swirling that motivated us to try to put down on paper that this is not just about police brutality, that this in this country is about a system of structural barriers that are 
um, pernicious, that are pervasive, that are enduring despite, you know, tremendous effort. That was an honest and excellent answer. Thank you, Michelle. Jeff, how about you? Your inspiration for the op-ed. So as, as Dean Williams mentioned, I mean, I've, I've had the honor of, of working with her um, she, and having her as a, as a great friend and, and, uh, and confidant throughout my, my public career when I was elected in office, as well as the team there at the School of Public Health with Bob Blendon and Nancy Trimble and my friend Eric. Um, this, this place is a special place. And for somebody who started out um, not thinking that it was a very special place because I grew up in the neighborhood, um, this, like the Dean said, I don't normally do this. This is barren. This is stuff that, you know, culturally we're taught, you, you don't need to do that. You don't need to bring that to the table. You just do what you got to do. But you know what? Enough is enough. You know, slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, Rosa Parks, church bombings, lynchings. In this community, in Mission Hill, remember the Carol Tomatey Stewart murder? Remember Willie Bennett? Willie Bennett, who the police sought out with, there was no facts, no nothing. And the description was a black man. So anybody, uh, Willie Bennett's skin color to mine um, were implicated. Rodney King, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, just enough is enough. And then aside from all this, the communities in which so many black people and Latinos live, they're broken. Racism killed George Floyd. And those things that are happening in these communities, they're, they're nothing new. I mean, you know, Rudolf Virchow, who was the father of pathology, said, do we not always find the diseases of the populace traceable to the defects in society? I can't breathe. I can't breathe. That's real in Black and Latino communities. Black and Latino kids having to sit out basketball games because of their asthma. And their parents are out of breath too because of the hypertension, because of the stress that exists in the communities. They can't breathe. The lead in the water in front, housing conditions, gentrification that in changed entire neighborhoods here in the city of Austin, the Commonwealth and throughout the nation. George Floyd's murder is an indictment on the discrimination and abuse here and around the world. You can see it in the protests in Mexico City, in Bristol, England, in Brazil, Spain, Brussels, Australia, Paris. People are saying enough is enough. COVID-19 just exposed further how their foundational cracks in the system that contributed to higher infection rates and deaths in Blacks and Latinos. Why can we not look at what other countries are doing and how they've handled COVID-19. The public health community remains in shock because how is it that in the Cook Islands in West Africa in March, while the US distributed meager social benefits and bailed out corporations, the Cook Islands, a small country with incomes roughly on par with Sri Lanka, devised a welfare package worse than 11% of its gross domestic product that included cash payments to older adults and a three month waiver of electricity bills for every, for every household. In Senegal, like many sub-Saharan African countries that has a mostly informal economy, making quarantines both logistically difficult and economically devastating, the country, the entire country had 86 intensive care unit beds before the pandemic. Nevertheless, Within weeks of the, the outbreak, local officials established 78 field offices, dispatched contract tracing teams, and allocated $160 million to the response. And as of Saturday, they had 47 deaths. Pennsylvania, a state with roughly the same population, had 5,900 deaths. What are we really doing? And how do we catapult our efforts? What do we need? What's relevant in terms of what we're doing and what isn't? And what is going to keep all these people that we have at the table that are, that are so passionate right now, how do we, how do we keep them at the table to, display, to dismantle and replace a broken system? And I definitely wanna hear more of your third thoughts, Jeff, on solutions. Before we get there, I do wanna keep the spotlight on both of you for a little bit longer. And Jeff, let's stick with you. Um, people look at you and Michelle and they say, you're so successful. Michelle is the first black female dean to lead the Chan School of Public Health. You're the first Latino chair of the Powerful Ways and Means Committee here in Massachusetts. 
but I imagine the path to here has not been easy. So can you just give us a sense of how your life experiences either informed the op-ed that you two wrote or what are some of the key challenges you faced along the way? The great thing about having Dean Williams as a friend in this is that we could always go back to the neighborhood because that's where our world and our life began. And it's so clear to the both of us. We could remember color, scents, tastes. We could remember the way things looked and from the positive view, but also there was a lot of things that just were just wrong. And I kind of view the world like through the eyes of a 14 year old kid looking out from the window of his housing project. Then for me, it was Mission Maine right there next door, next door to the, to the Harvard School of Public Health. I was lucky in this neighborhood um, because I had a powerful woman in my life. She was a leader in the community. She worked tirelessly to defend rights in the community relative to health and housing. She took on the presidents of hospitals. She took on the mayor, she took on the governor. And she, one woman who just was relentless, didn't stop and made change. And do many people know her? Well, no, not really. But the people in the community know her and her impacts were dramatic. And in the 70s and the 80s, what, we, what, what I saw and experienced is similar to what happens now. When, when we went through the, the desegregation order in the 70s and we woke up to the, to the, to the, to the marching of the, of the riot police on Smith Street, where the Harvard School of Public Health is right now, um, that was pretty scary. And then later, again, when the Carol DeMady Stewart murder happened, where the city and the press immediately implicated a black man, no questions asked. And we were, and we were, and we were treated, we were, we as kids were treated in a way that demeaned us, degraded us. I can remember being thrown up in, in, in hallways and, it, you know, in that housing project. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't a happy time. And not only that, we were living in a sick community. Again, everybody had asthma, hypertension, high diabetes rates. Um, but one thing that I learned is from my mother and from so many other people, like Dean Williams, like frankly, the, the mayor of the city of Austin, Tom Menino, who I learned a ton from, and, and the Speaker of the House most recently, who, who, who gave me the opportunity to manage a $43 billion budget and, and work on initiatives and, and writing criminal justice laws and doing a bunch of things. Um, you have to keep yourself at the table. And most of the time, you're gonna be at the table with people that you don't normally agree with. And one thing I've learned is that you can call people out, um, but you also have to find solutions now that people are at that table. Yeah, how about you? Sarah, Jeff used the word lucky. And um, it, it, you know, what the story that he just shared doesn't sound so lucky, all of the adversity, right? But we are fortunate that Jeff persisted, persevered, and, and used his leadership opportunity the way he did. In my case, I will use the word luck too. And it's gonna sound a little perverse. Lucky that I grew up in a household where from the time we started elementary school, we were trained and prepared and positioned to work twice as hard for half the recognition. That's perverse. But I consider that lucky because in the world that I grew up in, uh, that's the reality for those of us, many of us who are black and brown who have succeeded. We've had to work twice as hard to be seen. I feel lucky that I've been prepared and conditioned for this marathon that I'm on, but I'm also a little ashamed and I'll tell you why. Because I took that on my father, my mother, my community prepared us to work twice as hard. And I took that on and I expected that after 36 years of my own professional career, I wouldn't have to say that to my students or to my nephews and nieces. But you know what, when I look back, especially through the lens of the last three months, I have to ask myself, what have I accomplished? What have what have I done by 
buying into that work twice as hard for half as much. It's not enough. I feel lucky that I've had white teachers in my life that saw me. But for every one of those, I wonder about all the others who didn't see all the other people that look like me and that haunts me. It haunts me so much that it's difficult for me to celebrate being the first black dean of faculty at Harvard because I worry about all the others who should have been first that didn't make it because they didn't get seen or they weren't quite as lucky as Jeff and I. So even in trying to celebrate our success, I have to be really honest and say that there really is no complete celebration knowing that people before us suffered so much. And even in our own life's work, we've not come close to closing that gap. So Michelle, I wanna hear your thoughts about solutions. So from where you sit, what can you do? What can your institution, the Chan School of Public Health do to meaningfully address the problems of either systemic racism or police brutality? And particularly, why is it so important that we view racism through a public health lens? Yeah. Let me answer the first question, the last question first, because I think this is really hard. And this is where I wish I had stronger communication skills and I wish public health had um, by its side, a PR firm that could help all of public health really message what public health is, why public health and its primary position in civil society, economic and national security. Okay, so I'm going to do the best I can given the training I have. <laughs> For us, the air that we breathe, the places where we live, the work that we do, right, are all conditioned, right, on the social determinants. Our, all of these are social determinants that condition and contribute to our health. And all of those social determinants emanate from a history, a legacy, 401 years of structural inequality that brings higher levels of food insecurity, housing insecurity, insecurity in employment and finance, the wages that we earn, and all of those contribute to our health status. We chose public health recognizing that, as Lori Garrett would say, that Although 10 to 20% of health that we all recognize and appreciate are defined by health care, most of the resources go into health care when 80% of the determinants of our health are outside of the health care space. And we in public health have been trying for a very long time to fix the ratio. We have to fix the ratio and we need people to recognize that public health is more than healthcare. Public health is way upstream and public health requires the resources. And so we have to communicate that much, much more thoroughly. Fix the ratio if we need a little lingo. The other thing I know that we have to do and we, um, we must seize this moment is we have to recognize that if we really own the social determinants narrative, and we must, then we have to recognize that this is a complex problem requiring all sectors to engage. Mm -hmm. And I think we at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and we all across academia have to realize that public health is so important that it can't be left just to academia and to government. We need all sectors. And this is where we have a moment because COVID brought to everyone's attention the primacy of public health in the secure 
securing of our economic and civil society. Arne Epstein said it beautifully in just a few words yesterday on the forum when he said what we've witnessed in the last 12 weeks because of COVID and because of this police brutality that we all saw represents clinical and economic carnage. That's provocative and perverse language, but it so effectively communicates exactly what we've all witnessed. And it illustrates really how important it is for us to invest in all those social determinants that contribute to a healthy society, a healthy ec economy. And it's got to be looked through the lens of our history. So it has to start with truth. Um, Brian Stevenson said it perfectly when he was creating the first, the first national memorial to recognize the harm and damage and violence born on black and brown people in this country. You have to have truth before you have reconciliation. We have to be truthful about the problem that we're trying to solve, how pernicious and pervasive it is. And then we have to structure solutions in proportion to the size of the problem. And what solutions, Michelle, would you offer either from where you sit or from the broader university that might help get at this issue? Uh, I wish I had all the answers, but let me start with some, okay? Uh, I'm gonna start with the individual solutions, and then I'll go to the institutional ones. And, and I separate them because it's important. Individually, we have to be truthful, we have to be honest, we have to recognize that while it's painful to hear the word racism and racist, examine ourselves. Examine if you are not black and brown, what you've done every time you have seen something that might have made you uncomfortable, even if you were not committing that uncomfortable or seemingly racist act. Be truthful to yourself. And if you see something, say something, right? It works for national security. It works for how we conduct ourselves with compassion and openness in all of our spaces that we occupy. Register to vote and vote, and then hold the elected officers accountable. Celebrate the symbolic victories, but don't stop there. Holding our leaders accountable, being honest with ourselves are really important. See something, say something. Now on the institutional level, here's what I have to say. It's one thing to get the numbers right. And you know, I think most of you know what I mean. That when we are hit with crises like these, we say we've got to have representation on our boards, on our committees, in our leadership offices, in our C-suites. But that's just the beginning. Evaluate what your boards, what your committees, what your C-suite looks like, and be sure it's not just tokenism. Be sure that we are working not just to have representation at the table, but that you really see, hear, and act on, you know, the other things institutionally that needs to be addressed. You can't have an institution that is working against the pernicious and persistent and enduring strains of racist behavior and anti-black and brown behavior by just fixing your numbers. You've got to change the culture and it is not fair to have the one or two representatives or the four or five representatives or the 5% of representatives, right? Be at the table as Jeff alluded to and not have the full cooperation of the institution to be fully committed to changing, appreciating and addressing how tenacious and how insidious racist behavior and attitudes can be. I can be more specific, Sarah, but I'll stop right there. Okay, thank you. Jeff, you've already given us some solutions, but I want you to think about 
there obviously is no single thing that we can throw at the problem of police brutality and structural racism and expect that it's gonna solve the problem. So I'm not gonna ask you that naive question, but I want you to think about if you had to point to a few things that we should try to do right now, either as a state of Massachusetts or as a country that you think would make a meaningful difference to these problems, what would you do? Um, I'm encouraged by what I see. It's funny, that, that was not funny. No, this is funny. The, the defund movement, the defund police movement, I think is really something else because um, yeah, there was a, there were actions by Minneapolis to, to say defund the police, but at the same time, they also made it clear, it's not about defunding the police, it's reallocating resources. Mm -hmm. And there's a realization that's happening as a result of that, that really hard statement that say defund the police. Um, and I think that that's, that's it, figuring out how you really reallocate the resources. I remember when I, when I was in the legislature, we were trying to do that. And in the criminal justice bill that, that we worked on, we did exactly that, particularly when it came to the courts and bail reform and court reform and expungement law pieces. It was what, how do you take this apart? And I'm encouraged by what I've seen locally and nationally, some of the ideas that are coming out. There is good that's coming out of this. And it's because people are saying, we want to be at the table. We want to come to, we want to have a solution. And I would say when it comes, um, I would echo, um, what the dean had to say in terms of um, it's not just about finding the right person to lead a, a diversity and an inclusion office. This is beyond. This is way beyond that, you know. And we're going to have to work beyond the protests. You know, what was it? Thoreau said, you know, public opinion is a weak tyrant compared with one's own private opinions. We're going to have to get to people's hearts. Yep. Once the people stop coming to the protests, we're gonna have to get to people's hearts because we're gonna have to figure, people are gonna have to look deep inside to get, to realize it's broken. It's killing people and making them sick. So I, I'm encouraged by what I see on all fronts. And, I, and I'm, I'm excited to be a part of initiatives that that try to bring people together. And that's what I think it's important for us to do. Let's, let's get our word done. Let's, let's, let's make sure that we're heard. Let's make sure that we get to the table. Let's make sure that we're action-based, outcome-based. Let's make sure that we, we're, we, we are clear on what that problem is. This is systemic racism, it's police brutality. And we need to deal with it. We need to deal with this head on. This is enough. Enough is enough. enough. Enough is enough. Don't oversimplify the problem. I mean, it's so important. You know, I've watched the defund the police movement and I know where that comes from, but that would be an oversimplification of a very big problem that we have to address. And I think we in public health are positioned and prepared to understand that, um, you know, our public safety framework and our policing framework needs to be examined and reimagined and implemented in a different way. Defund the police is a catchy, very emotionally driven and appropriately laden statement, but it should only be the doorstop of a much more complex, nuanced, strategic opening for reimagining how we define and conduct ourselves in managing public safety. And I would say that that is the business of public health because in public health, we are trained to recognize that no single magic bullet, no single solution is going to solve a problem with so many different inputs and readouts involved. We have to recognize that this issue around public safety involves so many different social, economic, geographical, historical inputs. And when we redefine public safety, it will very likely require a shifting of where we put our dollars. 
and what metrics we end up putting on the dashboard and the report card. And in a lot of ways, it's still not very different than my wanting to re-examine that ratio. How do we promote health and wellness through a public health lens? Look upstream to the causal web that leads to the outcomes that we want to change or optimize. It's not easy. It's not a simple message. And that's Sarah, why I started with the challenge of communicating this complexity in ways that's more accessible and available that can change the hearts and minds that we have to do. So I recognize that there's work we have to do. This conversation could go on much longer, but we are at time. Michelle and Jeff, thank you for your candor and for your time. And to our audience, please stay tuned for more segments from Voices in Leadership in the coming weeks. In the meantime, please stay safe and take care. Thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you, you, Sarah. Thanks, team. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.